there are deep personal revelations that Christ will administer to your spirit and you will see every one of them come to pass and you arm yourself with it. Now, the, the kind of believer that is the most vulnerable believer is the believer that does not have anything to arm himself with by reason of his previous obedience to God and the things that God spoke to him that came to pass subsequently because he yielded in utter obedience to God. If you don't have that in your archive, you are not a strong man. Your hands have not yet been taught how to fight. You, your fingers don't know warfare because you have not yet come to a point where you lean on his shoulder. So in secret, Abraham learned how to lean on what? On God's shoulder. On the power of Christ. And then when he began to lean on God's shoulder, then the Holy Spirit assumed his office as a teacher and began to minister to him deep things of the Spirit that helped him in his navigation upon the face of the earth. Hallelujah. After that experience I had, if I'm praying now and God just speaks to me, eh? because that experience had changed my mindset. <clears throat> I've come to a point experientially where I know that God cannot lie. I, I, know, I know. And those things had a lot to do with that my wedding. Because there was so much impossibility staring me in the face. But because God was the one that instructed that the little money that I had saved, which was not sufficient in doing anything. Maybe somebody is saving money for a wedding here. You are saving money, saving money, saving it, saving it. May the Lord have mercy on you. May he have mercy. When I went there, I saw two cows. The way they were big, eh? The money I had would have expired to buy two of them. May, may God not abandon you and allow you your journey to be sponsored by the flesh. May, may he not withdraw his grace. Because every time there's a situation, people reach out to the resources of their flesh to administer, huh? do you understand? To support that situation. And your flesh is, is insufficient. And it's only the grace of God that is sufficient. Even you yourself, you are insufficient. And God designed you that way. So that by no means, by all means, you come to that point in God where you see the need for utter dependence on God. That's the message of Sikkim. You don't, you have not just started living a true spiritual life until you come to Sikkim. You don't even know God's capacity, how God's integrity, you have not proved it. Because you have not come to a point where you have depended on Him any time in your life. Absolutely before. So you don't know his, his you don't you have not tested his integrity. You have not tested how much he can teach you, how much he can educate your finger, how much he can give your finger skill in the midst of the fiercest of battles. You have not known it yet. You have not known it yet. A man like that from Plateau State. He went to the village and they did a ritual. Buried the ram. And they were able to get, remove his spirit from his body and hang his spirit on a tree. I know you don't believe those things anyway. I didn't too. I attended a faith college, faith Bible school. So I didn't believe those things too. Because we used to say, whatsoever. You f oh, until I started seeing visions. Hey! The first time I saw Jesus, I said, I have shown me in the Bible that you still appear to people. Oh. And he was not angry. Hallelujah. He wasn't angry. He didn't rebuke me. He, he said, in the scripture, did I appear to anybody in the scripture? I said, yes, you appear to John on the Isle of Patmos. He said, have I changed? Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today. If I appear to people before, I appear today. If I hid before, I hid today. If I raise the dead before, I can raise the dead and I will raise the dead. Until I started seeing visions. The guy was tied up on a tree. And then he came back to Joss without a spirit. And all kinds of sicknesses and diseases. And they were taking him to hospital. 
And you know the doctor study for six years. He must be saying something. He looks upon you. Take a tetoscope. Take ruler. He will, he will make a statement in the flesh. But the knowledge you acquired from the university has no authority to, to, to stand against that which has been orchestrated from the realm of the spirit. The Lord must teach your fingers to fight. He must teach you. must train your fingers. And on the man's tongue, it was as if they took razor and cut his tongue. Right? So we, they now called us to pray for him. When we were praying for him, so we saw his spirit was not there. Hey, this man has died. Where did you travel to? So I just came from the village. I built, finished building the house. So I went and, ah, you, oh, oh, you. <laughs> Somebody has possessed your house. That house you built, they have been waiting for you to live long to build it. So that they will cut you off. And the place of your burial is that place you came from. And your deliverance can't take place in the city. Go back there. And the instruction that came was put salt inside of water. And sprinkle the water around the whole compound. You know, it looks like madness. But you see, you cannot trust God that way. You can't trust the teacher that way until... In your life at a point you you have been helpless before, and it was that word that took you out of the dungeon and placed your feet upon the pedestal. You can't trust God's word like that. Can't trust it. You'll be a carnal man using your mind. Say, hey. Hey. Your your hands have not been trained yet. You don't know it yet. Hallelujah. Ah, you go to a, for a burial and God said, Don't eat here. That's when they bring young, young, fat young. <laughs> and if you eat of that young, it means your hand has not, not, not been trained. You might fall into an infirmity, a sickness might overtake you that will take 12 years of your life. Just because you have not understood that when God speaks, He doesn't speak for fun. And if you have not yet known how He speaks and why He speaks and the power behind His words, you might need to suffer for a while before you know how to trust in His words. Hallelujah. Put water in a bowl, put salt and started sprinkling on the whole compound with tongues. Malako Sakabaya Kapatama doing sanitation, spiritual sanitation until that place where the ram was buried, water was sprinkled, palata, pa, 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 and the man's spirit fell off from the tree and entered into the man. Instantly, his tongue that was cut, like as if they used razor, it was healed. And the man said, Jesus is alive. Hey, the whole village scattered. And then we came here and said, It has not ended. The man that buried that thing. He's going. <laughs> and then those elders, they now came and said, Which kind of pastor did you bring this time? Which kind of pastor did you bring this time? We have been seeing your pastors in the village. You have started serving another God now. You are serving another. La teba la baba la baba. And the man was healed. And then the man started driving his car. And he was, I don't know this rank, this police rank. I don't know the rank. Alright? The, the, the AIG, he's the aide to the AIG. When the AIG saw that he was healed, even though he was a Muslim, he requested for prayer. In Kano, in Kano, not, not in Bel Kano. In Kano. And I found out that the spiritual life begins when a man takes that radical step of, of consecrating to God. I will not do what I want to do. I will do your own business. And I will live as a living sacrifice. Not doing my will. But the if I still breathe is because I'm breathing to do your will. If you live that way, a witch can't stand up and kill. No, it's not given to him. It's not given to the devil. If your life is totally secured in God because it is submerged 
in the will of God. You don't need to pray special prayers for protection. Because God will always... I'm not doing what I'm doing at my own expense. I'm doing it at the expense of God. He was the one that brought me into this business. So I cannot be so conscious of my survivor now. Because it's your idea, God. But if you are living outside of the will of God, you need to pray for protection. No? And go for anointing. Night vigil. It's anointing oil. Say you are sealed for this month. <laughs> Leave for next month. It's just like the child card. When it, it, you have exhausted, you go and recharge. Oh, I recharge. I finish exhausting the one of last month. I need to anoint again. Survive for one more month. Stay alive this month. Because the guy knows he needs that prayer. He knows that his life is not balanced. What he's doing is his own agenda. So he needs all kinds of prophetic sympathy. So that he will have something to hold on. He at least they say that I'm going to survive. Hallelujah. But when you live within the heartbeat of God's will. And you have surrendered your agenda to the altar. And you are living only to do the will of God. You are excluded from all those rigors. And should I give you an assurance quickly? Divine protection is not assured because you attended an anointing service. I know you don't believe me. <laughs> See, I've lived, I've walked long enough with the Lord. Uh, I have proof for what I say. Proof. I walk long enough with him to know this truth. Sorry, I'm not one of the people you can deceive with the Bible at this stage. No. Your discernment builds when you have experienced God. And even if somebody raises the dead and says a lie from Scripture, you know it. And you live. See, the, with the, the little life I have left to live, I have decided to live it with the wise. Uh, I have enough time to live the rest of my life with what? With the wise. Men that speak truth. Because truth will advance me along the line of destiny. Are you still with me now? So that's the knowledge that Abraham acquired at Shechem. He was able to unleash the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit because he was leaning on the strong shoulder of Christ. He was depending on the power of God for survival. He was no longer doing his own agenda. And that which God has called him to do, he didn't have the ability to deliver it. So he had to depend on God for grace to live within the context of God's expectations concerning his call. That's where the Christian life starts from. That's where a genuine life of power starts from. Because if your life is figured within the context of the will of God and you stand up to pray, your prayer will have power. Power. It will have power. Because you are standing on the ground of the absolute counsel of God. Hallelujah. I... Mm. It's needful for us to understand quietly that when we talk about what will make your prayer effective, the first thing we need to consider is the man that is praying. Who is he? How accurate is that man with respect to the counsel of God? How much of the government of God influences the heart of that man? Are you with me? When we talk about how much of the government of God influences the heart of the man, we are talking about when the man finds out a contrary position with respect to his life in scripture, does he naturally shift ground to accommodate scripture? When the Holy Spirit whispers in the night time to his heart about the fact that he needs to change something in his life, does he make haste to change it? It means his heart is accurate with God. That's a man that has the government of God have found place upon his heart. 
Two, is a man living in the absolute will of God for his life or is the, is the smart type? He has everything figured out and he wants to live the rest of the days of his life upon the face of the earth to do his own stuff, to do his own will. Only that he comes to church on Sunday and Wednesday to receive blessings and benedictions to act as a rubber stamp on his ideas. And then such a man that is living in outright rebellion to God is expecting to pray and then uh, his prayers become powerful. Unconsciously, unknowingly to such a man, he doesn't understand that prayer is a kingdom function that has its strength in the fact that it is configured according to the will of God. A prayer only is powerful. If it is prayed within the context of the will of God, then we need to understand that a man praying also, if it's outside of the will of God, he is an embodiment of rebellion and the prayer of a sinner is an abomination to God. Did we get you to that point? Sorry, I... The words I bring to us this evening, they are hard. But they do good to the, to the spirit. They do good to the heart. They bring healing to the heart. Don't live lawlessly and expect that you will enjoy God's best. No. Don't think, like most guys when they finish from school, they are just, oh my God, I got a 2-1. And it takes off like a tornado. He's knocking on, 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 on the door of Chevron. Knocking on the door of Sarah. When shall I see? And he wasn't reasonable enough to inquire of God and say, God, I know I have a 2-1. But what will you have me do? Even this 2-1, I'm ready to surrender if, you, if it will do service to you. When I was through with you service, God said, drop all your certificate. Go back to Canaan and do missionary work for me. And when I'm done, when you are done, I'll come back for you. And the time was indefinite. All I was doing was teaching the Bible and discipling people. All I was doing was doing crusades in Canaan. When they said, when the Canaan State House of Assembly had declared that no Christian meeting publicly. If you do that, it's a crime. And God said, go out. And hold the crusade. And now begin to deliver the people of this territory. And when we came and got a carpenter. To begin to construct the crusade podium. Oh all the Islamic guys. You know they, they, are, they, are, they have a strong network. They have already ah, taken inventory. They, they uh, uh, saw our poster. And knew the dates of our meetings. While I was on the mountain top. In the hot sun of Kano praying. For the first night of the meeting. The Lord said. Two spies are coming to your meeting. I said, thank you, Father. Thank you. And when I came to the altar, I smiled. I said, there are two men here sent to destroy this meeting. Then I added my own. You know, God said, two spies. I added. I said, hey, if you don't come out now, you will die in 14 days. Yeah, me, I added that one. Amen. You'll be amazed that God will honor it. You'll be amazed. I can tell you, He didn't tell me. He just said there are two spies. It's as if He, he said, Anything you want to do to them, me, I want them down. If they don't submit, I want them down in 14 days' time. It's the Lord that teaches your finger to fight. But if you have not come to Moreh, if you have not learned how to lean, lean on the strong shoulder of Christ in utter dependence for your future, which you do not know, the teacher in Mure, you will not know his language. He will not tell you what to do. He will not guide your feet to the path of peace. Hallelujah. And right there after I gave the word of knowledge and the judgment of God that we follow, are the two guys... Began to shake. Jesus. Hallelujah. It was in that meeting. That meeting. Praying that night. Praying that night. Praying that night. And I wasn't praying for a cripple. A woman just started walking. Jesus. And they, <laughs> you know. 
A miracle that I didn't expect us. I said, God, this is a cripple. And you didn't tell me you raised a cripple. Oh my God. And God began to do strange things. And Muslims started visiting me after that meeting in the night. They come with uh, with hijab. And then when they enter, they say, they remove it, they say, now nah, see, look, look at me. Look at me. <laughs> we did more than a hundred deliverances. I mean hundred percent success. The one like frog, the one that can take matches as if you want to come and kill you. Say, Kai, stop there. Then you now say, eh, we have seen all of them. Because those Muslims began to bring their possessed children. Possessed of all kinds of spirit. Those days we had a, there was a chronicle. When we see the way the spirit manifests, we are crazy those days. We will now write a name, touch it. This can use a kind of spirit. This. But he will teach your hand to fight. It's in more that you, you gain confidence in the voice of the spirit. Because you are living in utter dependence on God. Do you understand now? There's no agenda to my life. There's no agenda. The point is that I just want to do God's will. That's all. Amen. When my wife was pregnant, the time had passed for her to deliver. The boy, the boy wasn't coming down. So I entered prayer. And then prayed for about one hour, one hour, 30 minutes. And then my eyes opened. I saw somebody with this Japanese cap. You know that cap that they wear? The eyes were covered. And he looked at me like this. I said, uh-uh. You? You don't want my wife to deliver? And then she delivered. Oh! He teaches our hands to fight. But he will not be under obligation to teach you if you have not made yourself vulnerable by submitting to him. Then he covers you by strategic information and strategic knowledge that will make you take a step when you need to take it. And just before the devil rises, you have taken a step and you are standing in a place of advantage and his grace covers you. When you have walked like that for a while, you have confidence in the voice of God. Hallelujah. Let's move further. Genesis 12, look upon it. The man in the land. The next point that we see Abraham moving to, verse 8. Genesis 12, verse 8. The Bible says, and he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent between Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord. And called upon the name of the Lord. Now I need to explain. Because. As we journey with Abraham. You begin to see the things that make your prayer powerful. Your prayer strong. First of all. Your life must be figured in the absolute will of God. And if your life is there. You, will, you know that you cannot sponsor it yourself. You have to lean on God for every detail of your life. Then at that point in time, you will be opened up to the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit as it teaches your hand to fight and your hands to war. Subsequently, God will move you. Because you might be powerful as an individual. But we cannot experience the fullness of Christ on an individual level. He will have to move you from just gaining individual mastery and moves you into corporate mastery. Now what this? This guy moves and he comes to Bethel. He was in between Bethel and Ai. Bethel means the house of God. And Ai means a heap of stones. Now the difference between 
a heap of blocks and a house is that the house is built and a heap of blocks are just a pile. Alright? God wants to move you from an individualistic life into a corporate life that is built by His Spirit. I know you are not, you are not with me. Now, I want you to understand that the golden rule behind all of Abraham's journeys is consecration. You get it? Because it's building altars. Golden rule. But you'll begin to see that at his travels along this path, his prayer authority and his prayer power begins to increase. Are you here? I'll just say this a little and then we'll stop and pray and exercise ourselves. My God. There are strange things here. In this hall. Strange things. That I see. God wants to move you. Now, several of us are strong individually, but you are not strong in the corporate life. Now, let me tell you why God must have you raise an altar at better. Now, there's a choice. It's either that I remain an individual with my individual strength, individual prayer life, individual capacity, or I fuse into that which God is building. Now, I've seen several Christians that if they had a healthy corporate existence, if they were part of a company, an apostolic community, Alright? Their strength would have been multiplied in the spirit realm. Notice in the book of Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. When Peter and James were beaten. Alright? The Bible said they went to their own company. They did not address the issue as individuals. But they went into the apostolic community. They went to their company. And then reported those things that are befalling them. And then corporately they began to pray. And to say why do they hid in rage. And the people imagine a venting. For the king set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord. And against his anointed. Saying. Let us cast their cause asunder. And bind their cause from the midst of us. They were quoting Psalms 2. Hallelujah. And then they began to. After quoting Psalms 2. They began to put all the variables in their own current situation that were revealed by some stew into the crucible of the scripture. They now said, all right, Pontius Pilate, Herod, you know the scripture in Psalms 2 say, why do the hidden rage? And then, as they were bringing a prayer point using Psalm 2, they now began to mention the name of the kings, those kings. Say, Pontius Pilate, Herod, all right? Because that scripture in Psalm 2 satisfies their condition on ground. And that prayer was corporate prayer. Not personal prayer. There are some battles that are corporate battles. You cannot fight it as an individual. There are some battles that are personal battles. If you bring it to, to the, individ, the corporate, this, you are wasting our time. That's the one you should handle and get some muscles. Do you understand what I'm talking about? When we talk about the territorial spirits that are operating within this region, it's not an individual battle. And just in case you try to fight as an individual, the pressure and the heat that will come upon you will leave some scars over your life. I don't believe that we should go on an escapade and come back with scars. No! If the Lord has trained us corporately to fight, if he has taught us the way of war, then we should go and pluck out stuff and come back and sing the victor song. The Bible reveals that when they came out of Egypt, that, see, he said, there was none feeble among their tribe. Nothing hindered them. Nothing left a scar upon them. I went to a place and one young man was preaching and he said, I went to Kasinala. And before I left there, the devil gave me a scar. That means I'm a general. Thank God he was not the last preacher that day. That was, he used that, he used his time to preach that message. 
He was the one with the mic that day. But he was not the last man with the mic. Because when I came, that was the first thing I had to talk about. The fact that you have a scar does not mean you are a general. It means that you don't know the laws of the spirit. It means that more. Alright? Oh, yeah. Let me not... Okay, let me cool down. I won't go too far again. <laughs> I have to open the Bible to the book of Acts of the Apostles chapter 26, verse 17. When the Bible shows us two elements governed by the sovereignty of God. That he made man of one blood and he, he preordained the appointed times and the, the, abound, the boundaries of their habitation. That means where you dwell part time is occasioned by God's sovereignty. Should be occasioned by God's sovereignty. You don't just say, I want to go to Enugu. Because in Enugu, this will happen, that will happen. If God had not said, go to Enugu, you might die in Enugu. Alright? And also, there's a time of visitation for every people, for every territory, for every land. If you go to Kasinala before the time, you might die there, not because you are a general. If you even go to Kaduna, Kaduna, now when God says, it's not you, but you took off. I can pray too, I can fast too, and you get there. Oh, definitely you come back with a scar. And the scar is an act of God's mercy. You should have been pierced through. Because there was a hole in your, in your armor. Hallelujah. You know when you preach the truth, you will lose friends, but let the, let see, you don't understand it. Huh? You lose friends. But let God be God and let every man be alive. Our generation has suffered so much from deception. And God in our day and time will raise voices. People whose voices are not bought. Silence by which heaven can still have an offerance in the earth. Hallelujah. There are some battles that are not individual battles. They are corporate battles. You can be trying to pray those battles, fight those battles as an individual. Hey. Alright? We have corporate faith and personal faith. In a move of God, like this. Hallelujah. There's corporate faith, like now, right now, there's corporate faith. As I'm preaching now, the faith level is increasing. The faith level is increasing. The faith level, and then you... A time will come, you feel like a giant, like Superman. You want to, hey, where's that devil? Man! Want to do something. You want to pierce now. Some utterances will come from your lips. You wonder, where were those utterances at home? The gift of faith has overtaken us. But when you go out in the night, even though the Holy Spirit is saying, pray now, pray, say, that's his own personal devil. Hallelujah. And the reason to still develop your personal faith in the midst of corporate faith is that when the corporate faith is no more, your personal faith will hang on. When the children of Israel disobeyed God and God is alright, all of you guys are going to die in the wilderness. My presence and covering that brought you out of the land of slavery will not go with you anymore. But the Bible says that there were two different men in the camp. It spoke about Joshua and Caleb. Because they had another spirit. They had personal faith. So when the corporate faith was not available, they could still get by. By what? Personal faith. There's corporate anointing. There's personal anointing. There's corporate prayer. There's personal prayer. And you never get to see the gigantic hand of God on a superlative dimension as an individual. They say, I know your prayer life is strong. You see some things when you pray. You know how to bring out the sword and pia, pia, pia. But you see, when we are up in a corporate house like this, so many streams are present here. And there are dimensions of the streams of God that are available to us on the corporate platform that is not available to you on a personal platform. And so in order for you to participate in corporate life, alright, you need to raise another altar. 
you will need to die to self to another level. And do you realize that in a corporate system now, the offense, the sin against a corporate life is self. You don't get it. You don't get it. Oh Jesus. You see, I'm losing words now. I'm losing words. I'm losing. I'm losing my ability to, to teach because the anointing is shifting to another level. So I'm losing the teaching office is going away. Help. Oh my God. Help me, Jesus. Help me, help me, help me, help me. Those days we used to pray together in the fellowship and in, in just simple prayer group like this and God used to come down. The presence of God was so sweet in our midst. And then there's a brother that used to come, you say, The Lord says, the flesh, the flesh, anytime he goes into that prophecy, the, he drains the presence. He drains the, the presence of the Holy Spirit. God withdraws permanently. And we go back lean and hungry. It's a manifestation of the flesh. It's just like cancer is not sickness. But it's just that a cell overgrows out of proportion. It takes all the nutrients for other cells and it doesn't transmit. So it's growing. Do you understand it? In the corporate life, if you don't let go self, if you don't let go you, if you don't let go me, if you don't lose your individualism, you will not be able to supply strength to a corporate reality. And God was taking Abraham to Bethel. But there was an option for him either to live in AI, a heap of stones, where everybody was an individualistic champion. But God was not building anything. Should I tell you something? No, you can't handle it. Just, you can't handle it. Can't handle it. Should I say something? In the last generation, the generation of our fathers, I said, can you handle it? All right. We had giants that were individualistic. Mighty ministries, but the ministries were not interdependent. That's not the will of God. And that's why another generation will come. It, that generation will unleash and reveal the locust army strategy. In the day of David, David was not the strongest in the army. But he was the man that had the template to bring warriors together. It was in David's day that the corporate life and corporate warfare was effective. But in Saul's day, it was the day of the giants. They were, that's AI. A pile of stones. So many. But nothing built and it's not connected. The Lord give you understand. The assignment of our generation is to bring back the spirit of a network. That was what existed between Jonathan and David. The Bible reveals that the bonding of Jonathan and David was stronger than the love of a woman. That's connection. In that covenant relationship, they will lose their individualism because of a greater kingdom purpose that their eyes have seen. And then in that atmosphere, God can build something. Becomes better. The house of God, where the presence of God rests. The, the vision of the average young man in ministry now is to build another tower. You, you can't handle it. I know. I'm only speaking to some people. But what God wants to do is to build better. And you must understand that that was the same place that Jacob came two generations later. He came to a place that his father had raised an altar to God. And the guy came there as a rascal. But when he came to that place, he entered into the website. It was a spiritual environment. That was where he discovered that spiritual things are never lost. That mantles of men of old that operated in the anointing, they are still there in the realms. But when you break into better, you see the reality of their work again. Then he put a stone there and said, this is the house of God and the gate of heaven. That's how he gave the name of the place, Bethel. The house. There is a house here. And I need you to understand that when David said, Come, let's go to the house of God. There was no temple. Solomon had built the temple. What was he inviting us to? Stand up, let's pray, let's pray. Let's pray. He was calling us to a place. That place is not a physical place. 
Yes, yes, yes. Something I've been stirred in the spirit. In the next five minutes, just speak in tongues. Yokes will break tonight. Things will happen tonight. The grace of God will come down mightily. If, if God spoke a word to you that you have abandoned, it will be quickened. It will be made effective again. Just lift up your voice and begin to pray in the spirit.